Greenwood. I'm the distance education librarian at Southeastern Oklahoma State University. Um, I am embedded in several classes here at Southeastern. We do have three instruction librarians here. Um, I primarily focus on graduate level instruction, but I also do help out with undergraduate instruction as well for information literacy topics, such as research methods, or just a general orientation into information literacy. Today, I've got a few poll questions. I'm primarily focusing on a PowerPoint presentation that I that I put together about a study that I did uh, fairly recently. Uh, Crystal Smith is my moderator and she's gonna be launching poll questions shortly. Thanks, Crystal. I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. So this presentation is about all that glitters is not gold, helping non-traditional online students navigate the information age. And I thought we'd start out by covering some of our population here at Southeastern. Like many universities, uh, online instruction is booming, especially since um, COVID necessitated online learning. Um, Things have been growing ever since. I can't say it's really slowed down a lot since then. Um, our non-traditional online students criteria differs between institutions. Some institutions say age, um, some say over 24, some say over 21 as a beginning student. Some say uh, waiting at least one year after high school, for example. Being a first generation student, self supporting with work hours, uh, being more than school hours, have children or other dependents, and having a GED. Here at Southeastern, our student population, um, the, the average age of a freshman is 21. And it just goes up through our graduate students, average age is um, just shy of 37. So we do have a, a pretty good um, percentage of students that qualify um, under those criteria, qualify as non-traditional students. As far as um, the delivery method is concerned, 7% are face-to-face, -face. they're campus students, they're only face-to-face, 24% -face. are hybrid, they do a little bit of both. 69% are online only. So that's, that's quite a percentage that we've got um, that are joining us as distance students. So some complaints that I reported either um, from students to the library or librarians or reported by other departments like CIDT or from some academic departments research is taking too long. Some say they've spent hours uh, looking for appropriate research for their papers. Uh, citation questions. How, I cite everything as a website, don't I? I got it all online, so it's all from a website. Um, you know, Wikipedia, what kind of resources are they using? What are they accustomed to versus what's expected of them? When did APA format change? You now, when students have gone to school and left and come back, they're returning, things change. And some of them are quite ready for that. And they're not familiar with the new changes. And some of our older students, I know uh, it sounds like a funny question, but I've actually been asked several times, I wrote my paper by hand, how do I put it in Word? And then from faculty, uh, papers are too biased. Uh, some students, well, a little bit too many students, will write a paper and only find sources that agree with what they've decided <laughs> um, should be the point of view that they're representing. Incorrect citations. Peer-reviewed sources are a must because 
They get tired of, of websites um, that are unreliable. So they start requiring uh, more and more pyramid materials kind of as a reaction to that. And many faculty have said they're spending more time teaching how to write a paper than they are their actual subject. And that's something the library can really help with. So some barriers that non-traditional online students experience is asynchronous communication. It can be really difficult to have a question, be working on assignment, and you don't get an answer for hours or maybe even days later. Changing citation formats can be really confusing and discouraging. You think you're gonna get an A, and then you get busted for citations just because you didn't realize there was a new format update. Perceived lack of student supports. Um, boy, that's a big one. There are so many students that they're unaware of what helps are available. Um, they're unaware that they're for free. Um, they're, they're just not um, aware of, of what's available out there to help them just in general. Uh, overwhelmed by information obesity. They don't know what's good and what's, what's great and what's not great. And they kind of throw their hands up sometimes and say, you know what, I'm just gonna use what agrees with me and cut it there. Students learning new software platforms. I think all of us have struggled with learning new software platforms. Uh, students do get it as a double whammy though especially when they've been out of school for a while and they're returning and everything that they thought they knew about um, distance education technology has completely changed. Or maybe um, there are new platforms entirely. Uh, here at Southeastern, we're getting Canvas. We're really excited about that. I do like Canvas. I used it as a student at OU and I think it's gonna be a really great change for us but it's a double whammy for our students who are returning. Not only do they have to learn their class material, they also have to learn how to turn in their um, assignments on the learning management system. And of course we have instructors who are learning new software platforms as well. And sometimes that can cause some communication lags. So what can librarians do to help with the information? Um, literacy of the students. We do, from the American Library Association, we do have a framework for information literacy. And I thought I'd just put out a poll here because I don't know how many of you have background um, in, in, library, um, in library studies. So Crystal, if you could just put out that first poll so I could see how many of us kind of have some background with these topics. So let's choose what your primary role at your institution. I know a lot of us play more than one role. Okay, it looks like most of us are instructional designers, some librarians, some other IT person. Great. Okay, so I'll just cover a little bit about um, a little bit about the ALA framework. This is a framework, it's kind of fluid. Um, the American Library Association has put out for information literacy. And um, librarians, which we tend to build materials and give instruction that cover these different aspects of information. Authority is constructed and context contextual. Um, that's kind of about where is your information coming from? Who wrote it? What were their qualifications? Do they have exper experiential knowledge? You know, do they have a degree? Do they work at a university? Um, just look at your information and see who created that. Uh, information creation as a process. Obviously, students are writing papers um, and they kind of get confused about um, some of the steps in creating information. Also, they need to know about the peer review process, how do research papers come about, where this information comes from. Information has value. Obviously, something we wanna cover quite a bit um, because they're gonna be making evidence-based decisions and we want them to value where their sources are and what they can use to make those decisions, either as a student or in their future careers. 
research is inquiry. Now, that's something that I try to hi highlight to students quite a bit, that when you do research, you're trying to find unbiased sources. Um, you want to make it a learning experience for yourself. So rather than choosing your topic that you already have decided you know everything about it and you're just looking for sources that validate your own bias, that's not really inquiry. What you're looking for is an experience where you find sources of various viewpoints and you put together evidence that's gathered by others in order to look in an unbiased way so you can learn and grow not only on your topic, but on your research method as well. Scholarship as conversation, for example, today's conference. Um, oftentimes, uh, different fields of study will change terminology. That's a type of scholarship as conversation. And then ser searching as strategic exploration, making a plan when you're trying to look for information so that you're not struggling for hours on end without really uh, any direction at all or any goal without a firm goal outlined. And you can get lost really quickly, especially in today's information environment. So librarians build them, those materials in mixed media formats on a variety of platforms. We use scaffolding to build skills, make them ADA friendly, not just ADA compliant. There's a difference. Um, ADA compliant um, materials can be read by say a screen reader or some other type of software to aid students. Um, but sometimes, that material might not make any sense when the screen reader is reading it. So not only do we need tags on our images, we need tags that make sense in the context of the material. Just for one example, we build them and have them ready for use. Uh, one example that, um, that's been developed here at Southeastern, uh, we have a pillar module and this is for any, any, any student at all, this is generally assigned by an instructor and the students earn a badge as they complete the pillar module. It covers very basic um, library skills, covers some library technology, as well as aspects of the framework. Here's an example of a tutorial, uh, website evaluation, and a lot of students need it and they don't know. So this one tutorial um, wouldn't cover just one aspect of, of the framework. It would primarily cover one and then cover several others second, secondarily. So this one is primarily about authority, but could also include a search, searching a strategic exploration, uh, research as inquiry, and so forth. A tutorial on different types of evidence and how you could use them would also cover information has value. Here's a tutorial on how to build a paper. So that would be information creation as a process. So these materials have been built by librarians all over. It's not really any different at Southeastern than it is at any other institution. We have services that are often offered wherever you go, not just by the library, but other departments as well. Um, CIDT or maybe IT might cover some tutorials on how to use some platforms as well. And we try to develop all these things for students, but what I found in my study and what I found here at Southeastern is that while these things might be really great and they're built and they're prepared and they use the framework, and they're ready to go and they're ADA compliant and ADA friendly, but only a small percentage of the students are using them. Either it's due to unfamiliarity or perception that they aren't relevant to their assignments. So I really needed to improve, not necessarily just the materials, but also the perception that the students had of the materials, even if they, even if they were aware of them or not. So what I 
decided to do was to start a formal study so I could collect some data and make some decisions based on the data. I needed to collect more information. So I created a before and after survey and uh, some of my IRB application and started a study. And right off the bat, um, you know, I put it in, I put the survey in uh, two graduate classes and an undergraduate class. So what I got back was uh, initially it looked really great. <laughs> initially I was like, oh, look, like 94% of the students are, are somewhat likely, at least somewhat likely to use the library. And it looks really great, right? And then I pulled up all my numbers. Only 18 of the students filled out that survey. So I had a problem. I have what we call a non-response bias. And so the survey couldn't really be used for what I designed it for initially. It turned out that I needed to use it for something else. I needed to use it to measure student engagement with the library or the librarians. So I took that number of 18 students, which there are probably 18 students who have already experienced some kind of library interaction. Um, or friendly with the library or somehow associated with the library while they were in high school before they even came to the university. So I needed to do better just for student engagement. And what I found, and we have a book now called Envisioning the Framework. I love this book. I love this book. It's edited by Jeanette Fitch and um, produced by the Association of College and Research Library. So they published it, it's put out now, we can read it. And they gathered some information from other instruction librarians like me. What kind of hurdles do I need to face engaging with these students? And they found that there are several misconceptions about the library or about information literacy in general. And this is what I really uh, needed to overcome. And I know this is primarily about first-year students. Uh, first-year students believe they're supposed to do research without assistance. Um, believe freely value available inter internet resources are sufficient for academic work. I found that a lot. Um, and one of the things that really concern me, and I feel like a lot of faculty have given feedback in, on this as well, the students believe they're already information literate. So they think, oh, I've been Googling for years. What do I need the library for? And I've even, I've heard honor students say that this isn't really all that unusual. I have another poll. Um, see how many of you have also experienced comments like that, or um, have you found misconceptions like that at your institution? 100%, okay, so I'm not alone there. Um, something really interesting that was found in this study was also that um, the students who had more years of experience with successful Google searches were more certain that they were information literate. In fact, they were more certain in every misconception. So those non-traditional students, they're not necessarily first year students. Maybe they've gone and they've come back, but they've skipped a few years before enrolling in college. They're even more certain about these misconceptions. So how do we, how do we jump that hurdle to even get them to the point where they're willing to try library services? For these students, accessibility isn't enough. So I have all these materials available. They're on the library website, libguides, all of this. They're all there, they're beautiful. They match the framework, they check all the boxes, but it's not enough. How does one empower these students who have never experienced the efficacy of library materials or information literacy instruction? 
we have to go beyond the framework. Framework, it's not enough for what they're needing. So we have this really great framework. It's fluid. It, it matches a lot of the things that they need. But in, our, but in that study, in that book, Envisioning the Framework, Finch accurately points out the framework does not have the library or the librarians in it. It's not mentioned in your framework. Materials might be top notch, but without experiential knowledge of library assistance, students don't trust them or see them as necessary. So you can add the library in, you can add it in um, as an extra step in the framework. You can add it in as a maybe a, down here, just add in the library or what do librarians do? You can put in there completely separately or you can put it in there a little more implicitly. Um, what I found is that we need to design libraries, library resources for online learners, for their specific needs. Okay, some examples of that can happen after we collaborate with our education partners. So librarians don't generally go just wander into, into the classroom. Um, we have to be invited. So when we collaborate with other education partners, we get access to the students and we got opportunities to do some instruction, maybe a visiting lecture. Um, as an embedded librarian, I get to join discussion boards. And that is a really, really important part. Some ideas that um, might help with collaboration, even if you're not in library, maybe you're instructional designer and you create materials, but a certain group aren't using them yet. You can send them to an instructor and say, hey, I built this for your students. Please send me your opinion so that I know that this is usable, this is relevant. And then get some feedback from them and then ask if you can send it to their students. Initiate conversation. Rather than waiting for students to come to you, be the one to jump out there and start a conversation. Even if you're entering a, a group chat or a group discussion, discussion board in a class, go ahead and jump out there and say, hey, I'm here. Did you know about this service? Did you know this might help you in your, to your topic? Or, hey, that's a really great research project. Could I suggest this for you? Find out what kind of experiences they've had with different types of information. Everybody's had an experience with bad information, everybody in the workplace, in school. And then once you get information about what they need, like specific needs um, about their current assignment and their current course, then make their materials more relevant to that specific need. Might be a video, a tutorial, a live Zoom session. Some examples for library materials um, in Native American um, history. Uh, we do have a Native American leadership program here at Southeastern. They need primary resources for their research. Um, the things they need are completely different than something that you might find for the special education degree program, okay? So tailoring what's offered to them helps them realize the relevance of the material. So they could say, oh, hey, I do need an APA tutorial, or hey, I do need a CMS tutorial. I didn't know there was one available. Here's an example of a libguide that librarians generally build. A lot of libraries have seen um, a decrease in the use of library guides, but I have seen an increase. Um, the difference, well, really the major difference that I found is that when I build a LibGuide, I build it for a specific course with a specific instructor. I might consult with a department head. Um, I do collaborate with the instructor and say, hey, I'm building this just for your class 
and your students' assignments. Sometimes I do build a LibGuide for one instructor and build another one for another instructor with the same type of course. But I do very specific things. If they have a reading list, I link the reading list in the library LibGuide. So the links are always good links and the students get familiar with how to use the library. So how's it gone so far? Here's some results. I'm very happy to say that um, working with students and making more relevant materials um, or catching their attention to more relevant materials did increase engagement quite a bit. With the same survey, thank goodness, <laughs> I got 120 room responses out of 122 surveys distributed. And how likely were they to use the library? 91% said very likely, 9% somewhat likely. Nobody said they weren't going to use the library at all. So, so got some student engagement and I got some survey results that I can actually use. Um, just for a comparison, have you found library instruction you received to be relevant to your needs? On the left, only 18 responses. So not really a great survey response not really great statistics that I can work with. On the right, 121 responses. So I know I still, as always, we always have room to grow. And I, like everyone, have room to grow and develop more materials and instruction methods. Um, instructors did give some feedback through a survey and they had very, very positive responses. Um, I was very lucky to work with some faculty um, that were aware of the information literacy needs of their courses. And um, they just really enjoyed having embedded librarian. So now just kind of have to structure who gets an embedded library and when, you know. And 89% of students received information evaluation instruction, like the website evaluation, for example. 89% of them are now showing proficient. And instructors that use it embedded librarians are reporting they now have more time to cover their subject. So that was my big goal there, was giving instructors some support. Um, if you, here's my last poll question, just to wrap up our session here. What would you take advantage of if you had the opportunity? Okay, well, thank you for joining my session today. We've got some who are interested in course specific LibGuides, more collaboration. I know some even instructional designers really, really like that uh, feedback from collaboration, information literacy tutorials, and instructional videos. So that's great. That's some great feedback. Thank you so much for joining me today. Did anybody have any questions? Thank you, Diana. We are Thank right at time, much. but I'm. Um, but if any of you want to stay for a couple of minutes and ask questions, you're welcome to. Thanks, Crystal. No problem.